the crusade for me, if you will, for lack of a better word, I guess, yeah, has always been about food and the Miami dining scene and uh, the community as a whole. But this year, it's like it's a lot more than that. It's a lot more than just those things because, in reality, it's about survival and it's about getting through. What is it with the four four seasons total landscaping thing? Can someone <laughs> fill me in here? I love I don't know what happened. All I know is it looked like there was a press conference in a, in an alleyway behind Booby Trap and I'm not sure what was going on. Okay, so here's here's what's and I, I'm forgetting some of the details. Maybe I'll come in after the fact. That's fine. And fill this in with some of the We're details. We're all about forgetting details here. Yeah. So my understanding is that they were going to do a press conference with all the same bullshit they ended up saying. Right. And because the press conference was going to be very close to a bunch of protests, they moved it. Oh, so okay. they found this nearby parking lot <laughs> yeah, to do it in. And like, they when someone uh-huh. apparently told Trump we're doing it at the four at the parking lot of this place called Four Seasons Landscaping, and Trump being Trump not paying attention, Etropede. being a fucking idiot, Etrump. decides in his mind that it's at the Four Seasons Hotel, and that's of what course. he tweets. That's <laughs> he tweets. <laughs> he says, we're doing it at the Four Seasons Hotel, something, something, blah, blah, blah. Huge. And they end up there. So everybody thinks, uh-huh. and that's the thing, it's, like it's bullshit all around, right? It's bullshit from every angle, because then on the other side, it's like you have all these people pretending that the organizers of this thing actually don't know the difference between... The hotel and the landscaping. Everything place. is dumb. Everything is fucking stupid. Mm-hmm. Do me a favor. Put put that thing more this way. No, even more if you want. So it's not in, like that. That's perfect. Yeah, like face it. Like kind of like what we're doing here. That way that it's not between you and the camera. Whatever makes you happy, Nick. I just want you to win senior class president 2005. Still, I'm, it's, it's I'm ready over. for a recount. I'm ready for this recount. Welcome. Welcome to Bang Gong Podcast. I am Nick Jimenez. I am joined. I already did this. Did you? We're doing it again. Yes. No, no, I already but now did that the there's intros. cameras involved. Those fucking cameras before. But I wasn't here. All right. No, do the intro. I'm no, excited I'm, for this. I know. I'm good. I'm, I'm, uh, 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 I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> you're, uh, you're the senior class president 2005. I'm just uh, president elect of this, uh, this podcast. I was a presidential hopeful who was, uh, who was screwed over in a runoff. Is this by, new? Is, is by this? By Armando. Uh, Armando. Uh, by Armando, who we all called a bicho. And he wasn't president? No, he was an administrator. Oh. And and he screwed me oh, over. Oh, he screwed you over. He screwed me over. The man. He didn't like the me. The man had a, had a vendetta, screwed you over. He had a vendetta against my family. I'm shocked that someone had a vendetta against you. A, against people who predated me. Carluba. Let me ask you, Carluba, did you vote for Nick when he ran for president senior year of, of high school? Get in here. I ran for vice president. Wait, were you? But were you his? Uh, were you his Kamala or Pence? No, I don't think. No. No, it didn't work. That it way. didn't work that way. Oh, it didn't. So the the, the way that you didn't have a running mate. So he wasn't your running mate. No, it didn't work that way. This seems like a whole different political system over there, over there, Belen. So the the way that student council at Belen worked. Uh, the president was in charge of boring things. Just so everyone... And our vice presidents did parties. Our millions of followers across the world. 22 million. 22 million. No, Belen Jesuit is a high school here in Miami, Florida. Correct. So, yes, I, I would have been in charge of all the boring shit. And vice presidents were in charge of party-related things. Uh, and party so, as your political no party. no like dances and shit like that that like the vice president well of I would imagine parties. Carluba would be much better at that than you would a hundred percent no yeah. no I would never have even wanted could you imagine a party thrown by you oh, would Jesus. be the dullest exactly. thing it would be so bad everyone would be playing chess let me tell you right and now and then people would be debating no. in one corner and then there would be anarchy in the middle it would be like a mosh pit and then chess and then and then uh, debate. Can I tell you one thing I know for sure about a party that I throw at Belen? Sure. I wouldn't be there. <laughs> <laughs> I won't go to that party. <laughs> that was good. Yeah. That was good. 
Uh, so anyway, we're doing this. Uh, we, we're having this awkward start to the podcast because unfortunately, a guest that we were going to record with had to uh, postpone. We will be recording in about 24 hours with that person. Uh, but we had always planned. This actually kind of worked out more or less because we had planned to do two of them. We were railroaded by Mario Obregón, an alum of the uh, of, of the podcast. Loca <laughs> by the loca. He's a uh, black bean loca. Black bean by by noted black bean loca Mario Obregón. Just uh, so people know, he uh, he reps a uh, black bean. Brand. I think it's called America's Made. America's Made Black Beans. If you haven't heard of them, you know, Mario Obergon, he co-signs them. I would go out and try them. Uh, they weren't on our uh, black bean tasting, but maybe they will be one I'll day. eat any bean Mario co-signs. I don't know if I feel the same way. No? No, I don't well, know. Well, you know, you're a chef. You're another level. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we had intended to record two of these anyway, and one of them was just going to be us. Kind of shooting the shit because it's been a while since we did one of these without a guest. Uh, so, a lot has happened since the last time in the world oh. since the last time that we did one of these without a guest. I'm exhausted. Yeah, I'm so exhausted. Tell me some of the things that are exhausting you. Well, for uh, I mean, for the first time in I don't forever, I guess I don't know. I'm not good with history, but the presidential election was like six days long. Right, like the whole like Some, from yeah, yeah. from submitting your your uh, your vote to actually like finding out who uh, the president elect would be, mm-hmm. or if we were going to get another term of of huge Trump, huge, um, you know, and then all the stuff that went with it, just like the, and then there's still like there's more coronavirus stuff, and it's just like it's just so it's exhausting. I'm yeah. like exhausted. By the things, and then also I'm exhausted about people telling me who they voted for and why I should agree with them. Right. Because I don't care. <laughs> like, I don't, I, even the people that I could agree with, like, I don't need your uh, car caravan with all your flags to tell me about who you voted for and why I should agree with you. I just don't. And that's like, that's part of the exhausting part. We're already just trying to survive. Right. In the year of 2020. Along with that, we have all of this trash equal on all sides, on all sides. doesn't matter what side you're on. It's all trash to me. It's like because so if you voted for Trump, okay. If you voted for Biden, okay. But just because I could not agree with you or I do agree with you, I don't want to continue to talk about it. I'm like, I'm sorry. And then the the memes and what makes it worse, the memes and the things what makes it worse now is social media, right? Because all of this, whether factual or not factual information is at your hand at all times. And so people just want to tell you things all the time. And then any fuckface with some kind of program can create a meme with a bunch of not factual information and then just throw it out into the world and be like, well, look at this. This is all real. And then some other asshole is going to be like, yeah, look at this. Did you check? No? Yeah, but look, it's fine. Everything's fine. No, everything is fucking dumb. Yeah, and I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted by it because the reason why I don't talk about who I voted for or I ask you who you voted for because it's over. It, for me, it's over. Okay. The voting process is over. I win, I voted. You win, you voted. I don't know if you voted. I don't care, honestly. I just, it's over now. And we're, we're, we're moving past this thing. And it's like, no matter who you voted for, there's pros and cons to all of them. And that's the truth. Sure. There is not one politician that I can look at in the face, right? One person. For, Forget sure. politician, person. C- correct. But the reason why a politician is more important is because they, we elect them. Yeah. Human beings, we don't elect them. They just happen, right? right. So, like, I, I don't, there's plenty of people I vote for that I don't agree with everything they say. So now we have to deal with the policies of people that we voted for, right? Or not voted for, or whatever. And it's just, It's going to be another four years of this stuff. You know, it's going to be another, uh, like, very tumultuous four years. It doesn't matter who the president is. It doesn't matter who you voted for. You know why? Because America is fucked. It's very divided. There's a lot of divide, like, a lot of division between people. And you know why? It's created by them themselves. You cannot change human beings. We cannot, at this point, say that politicians are the only problem. Because they're not. Sure. We, in essence, are the problem. 
right? Human beings want to be heard all the time, right? And this continuation of just like, these are like all my thoughts and stuff. And it's just like, I just, if you don't agree with me, you're fucked. No, I don't agree with that. You are my friend, right? Mm-hmm. I disagree with you all the fucking time. I think you exaggerate how much we disagree. I, I disagree with a lot of people all the time. Sure. But I don't, it doesn't mean that I don't like them as a friend. And that's what I'm saying. So let me push back a little bit here. Sure. On the idea that it doesn't matter. I'm not, I'm not. What do you mean it doesn't matter? Wait, go ahead. That it doesn't matter who you voted for. Because, and the reason I say that, oh, sure. I, I get it in the sense that, the, yes, the election already happened. And so we're not all still in the position of, you know, being about to vote and trying to convince people to vote for this one or vote for that one or whatever. And in that sense, I understand. But in another way, we're not done hashing out these disagreements. And. To the extent that's that, true. To the extent that who you voted for is one of many ways to distill, like, to sort of explain, at least in a nutshell, because you don't always have time to talk a day or in a podcast with somebody. That does tell you something about where people stand, and so in that sense, I think that it can be useful to talk about, like, hey, listen, this is who I voted for, and then if you have time to get into, and this is why, and this is why I didn't do that, and didn't do this, yeah. Thanks. You said it. Talk about it. Right. You said it. You 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 said the word that right now people do not do. Right. They don't talk. They don't sit down and have a conversation. I'm not saying it's the only thing that matters, but I think it can be useful. Sure, and I would I would agree. If there was someone that disagreed with my my views, right? Sitting across the table from me. Let's say this. Let's say there was an incredibly racist person sitting across the table from me, right? Okay. And we sat down and we talked about our differences. We just talked. And I think you and I shared once uh, an incredible video. And I don't... It was on Vice. It was a, a guy. It was an um, African-American guy that was... It was, a, it was a trailer for a documentary. No. Uh, the About the jazz musician who... Uh, no, 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 no. No, this was the one that was like... In the middle of buttfuck nowhere, right? And it was like a Nazi family, and they were they were raising their two kids oh, to be yeah, like yeah, neo Nazi yeah. types. And then yeah. the interviewer, which was from Vice, was an African American guy. I think he was like British or something. Sounds right. Something like Maybe. that. And then he sat there and he and he talked to them. He tried to understand, and he, then he voiced his opinion, and mm-hmm. they had a conversation. You see that? That to me is powerful. There's more power in that right. than me sitting here yelling at you and not agreeing with you. And we get so much of that. You're super right wing and whatever, and mm. all Democrats are socialists or whatever. And then you're super left wing, and then every Republican is a racist. And so on. that neither neither one of those are true. Yeah. All all I mean by pushing back on it doesn't matter is I think it can be useful. As a springboard to that conversation, I think it, I think if you let it, oh, I voted for so and so. Even if you both voted for the same person, I think it, if you are curious enough, a person, it can be a springboard to, oh yeah, we both voted for the same person. Did we vote for that person for the same reasons? Absolutely. What well, were you that, but so that's, that's good. That's, that's, that's good. All, that's, that's good. I, good. It can I, be useful. I would say, I've sat and talked to several people that we we could or couldn't we could, we voted for the same person, right? For very different reasons are we deliberately not saying who you voted for i'm not going to say who I voted okay that's for. fine and I, I don't i don't care for people to hit me up with like stupid rhetoric about why who i should have voted for and who i shouldn't have it's uh at pig inc <laughs> right i there's people that we voted for the same person for vastly different reasons and uh it'd be less in there like yeah all right this is great i'm like well but it's great but have you thought about these things that this person that we voted for does Mm-hmm. And like, well, not really. I'm like, well, maybe you should think about that. Right. You know, it's the same thing. Like, I mean, I'll say I voted for Obama, right? But Obama, Obama sat with Raul Castro, which is something that I'm, I'm obviously vastly against. Mm-hmm. You know, and I can voice that. I mean, sure, my yeah. freedom as an American is to say that I, I, I voted for the man, but I disagree with some of the things that he did. There's this like. In- incredible divide and i Mm -hmm. think that the division has to do with very serious topics right 
racism being one of which, which I think my thoughts on racism is that they, it's always been prevalent. And I think, and the reason why I think it's always been prevalent is because I lived it, mm -hmm. right? But I think the difference now or over the last eight years, what the biggest difference would be information is at your fingertips at all times. Mm -hmm. So if John, sorry to all the Johns, John in Wisconsin, sorry all Johns in Wisconsin. There's a lot of them. Right. Is a, is a racist, and he says that all Cubans are spicks and they should uh, swim back to their country. He could put that on social media and everyone would know, and I would know. You would know. Sure. Carlos would know. Yeah. Right? That's the difference between now and 20 years ago is mm. that that information is readily available, right? So yeah. do I think that racism uh, has changed in the last 50 years? I'm sure that it's definitely uh, the percentage of racism has gone down. Sure. Okay. But do I think that it's still an issue? Yes. I do think it's still an issue. Sure, yeah. I don't think anybody denies it's an issue. Uh, right. But these are like the trigger points, right? And then they use those things for these political campaigns. Right. Same thing with socialism, right? Um, Democrats are socialists, right? Now, there are Democrats that sit in office that label themselves as democratic socialists. Right. And that is fundamentally a problem right. for me as well. Yeah. The people that can hang their hats say that they're okay with socialism is, socialism is a problem for me. Right. But it doesn't mean that all Democrats are socialists. Right. Yep. Just like it doesn't mean that all Republicans are racist, even though the, the two topics are very different. Sure. You know. But it's also like Republicans only care about the one percenters. That's not totally true either. Right. It's just there, there's fundamental flaws to all these arguments. Right. And there's fundamental problems with all the arguments. But people find one word that's wrong. They find one thing that's incorrect. And then they double down on that and they make a meme about that. And then the meme is on social media and then it hits it hits a million followers or whatever it may be. So I don't know. And it's just like uh, the phrase defund the police, right? The defund the police. Like, what did that even mean? So mm -hmm. many people hung their hat on that. What did that even mean? Well, and the interesting thing is I think, um, you know, I, I think part of what you're – I think ultimately most of what we've talked about so far can be distilled down to uh, – it's good? This is Better good. than the last thing? I think so. Yeah. Uh, do we want to pause and let people know what you're drinking? Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm, I'm drinking. Not, I don't know what's going it's on It's delicious. Here. This though. is still the plantain thing. There's plantain somewhere. No, I don't think so. Oh, that's a different thing? No, it's a different thing. Okay. Yeah. Then everyone listening here is very confused. Whatever. Um, I think most of what you're saying can be distilled to some version of there should be a conversation beyond sound bites and just the sort of treating whoever you voted for as like, I'm on this team and I'm on that team. There's, there's other shit. To me, I'm on the team of, of the like of America as a whole, right? Like I don't, I'm not. But that's why I always go back to the fact that you know, just because you're a Republican or you're a Democrat mm -hmm. doesn't mean that I find you on separate teams. We're on the same team. It's like almost like an offense and a defense, I guess, for me to use like football terms. Mm -hmm. We're all going towards the common goal, which the common goal is the country as a whole. Yeah, this and, being our national end zone. <laughs> sure. Yes. <laughs> the national end zone and Which keeping, for keeping our, the football inside of that suitcase. Of for our European racing. listeners, uh, yeah. well, we have making it into million the million. end zone gets you six electoral votes, uh, which is statistically insignificant unless huge. you're in a very tight race. Very huge. Uh, it gets you one. Uh, who has six electoral votes? I think that gets you like Alaska. Is that six? Yeah, I, think I think you're right. So. I think it's six. Yeah. Alaska has that gets six. You, so getting into the end Overwhelmingly zone. Overwhelmingly Republican place. Right. It, it, it gets you <laughs> one Alaska. Trump won Alaska like 90-10. Today. You know, oh, they, they just came out with those numbers today. Alaska. There you go. They nailed down Alaska? Good. So he's at like 205. I'm glad we've settled that as a country. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Alaska. Now we know where Alaska stands. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Inuits. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sure we have a couple of people listening in Alaska. Oh, for sure. All the Cuban uh, traveling nurses in Alaska are all over this podcast. We are the number one. We are the number one Miami-based chef-driven podcast in Alaska. Uh, for sure. So, but yeah, I, 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 I think that you know that there it can all be distilled down to some version of there should be a conversation. So, for the which I think is. I think anybody would agree with, even if they don't live up to that, right? right. Because I, I, I'm frustrated by some of the same shit. Because I have very, like, fringy views 
Uh, <laughs> that's an interesting way to put him. I, 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 I am on a political fringe. Uh, I'm sure people have heard me say Eat this. Eat a before. bag of balls. Eat a bag of balls. <laughs> Uh, as, as Kennedy would say on Fox Business to uh, Republicans and Democrats, eat a bag of balls. Yeah. Uh, so I guess without getting into who you voted for, because we're not going to do that, talk a bit about just like forgetting all the noise that people make in the ether. Sure. When you are voting, not even necessarily this year, just in general, like what are the, or let, let's talk about this year. What are the things that you personally, what is your, because I think very often we get bogged down in this thing of like, the whole country is going through this, right. but there's also an element of like, I but, am going through X. Right. I, I would say my personal views and my professional views are very different. And I think it's a very fine line. Okay. I'm a business owner, but I'm also a human being. So for me, there's things on both sides of that, that matter to me. So when I vote... There's things that I think about on both sides. I'm also a very uh, different business owner in the way that I operate my life. Not everything for me matters about dollars and cents. Sure. For me, a lot of things matter about the world uh, all around, you know. I emphasize this to all the very emotional voters and all the very, like, enthusiastic voters the presidential election obviously matters. Your local elections mm-hmm. matter more. Mm-hmm. And I will tell you this to I'm fucking blue in the face. Well, we don't have time for that. Local elections will destroy your community and will destroy the economic value that your community holds. And the reason why I say that is because right now we have people sitting in office that do not give a fuck about me or you, or any of human beings that own businesses, they care about nothing but themselves. And that's what matters. And you could look at the evil that's in the presidential office, whether you're a fucking Democrat or a Republican. But the truth is, the people that control your local government are way fucking worse. Because the outside world, right, CNN, they don't talk about Francis Suarez or Carlos Jimenez or Joe Carroyo or Keon Hardman or fucking Ken Russell. They talk about none of those fucking people, right? But those people affect your daily life. Those people, uh, the way that you handle your daily, that matters more. So I hope when it comes to local elections, people start to give a fuck more. And they start to pay attention to some of the things that are happening. Businesses that are being closed for no fucking reason. Uh, Just like curfews that continue to happen for things that I'm not totally sure why, because there's no actual definition to why they happen. Um, it's just like a continuation of such. And then on top of that, when you question those things, for your elected officials, you are often told to shut the fuck up in layman's terms. Mm-hmm. And if you don't, there will be a price to pay. Right. I feel often like I'm in a fucking 40s mob movie. And I think, listen... I don't necessarily agree with, I'd say, 90% of the things that Billy Corbin says. But I do, I do agree with some of the things that he says about local politicians. Mm-hmm. And it's a racket. It's a racket. It's all about money. It's all about money. And Miami's got a lot of fucking money. I will say, on the Billy Corbin thing, by the way, he has been a guest on this podcast. And you should Google uh, or go, go on datamag.com and search for Billy Corbin in the search bar. Um, We're live on Instagram. Right. right. That's good. Uh, so I I hear you on Billy Corbin calling it a racket. Where I differ with Billy Corbin, uh, and I'm going to try to sort of restrain myself here because that's this fine, is because your name is on the sandwich. That's fine. Uh, but no, not, not out of consideration for Billy, more because to not make this about me. Uh, but I differ with Billy Corbin in that I think he has a habit of, oh, it's all a racket except for these people I like. Right, right. And they're fucking angels. Yeah, that's true. And that's what I don't know. Like, I, I think that it's very hard to take the it's a racket and this person is Fidel Castro shit seriously when then you're turning around like, oh, and this other person yeah, but is it's, the one who is going to, to borrow a Biden campaign phrase, save our souls you know, if we just put this person save as the souls. district attorney, this person will save the soul of Dade County. Like, no, bro. This on. is my my 100% belief is that there is no politician, not one, 
that will have my best interest at heart. There is no politician that does not have self-interest first. And that's just the truth. You know why? But But no, hold on. Okay, yeah. You know why? Because I've said, and I can't, you know, because I can't say certain things because I'm not supposed to, but... Do you want to talk about why you're not supposed to? Just to give yeah, some context I, 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 because I'm a business owner, and right. I fear. Right. I fear for what I will have to deal with if I say things that people have done to me personally and to other people in and this. This isn't a fear that exists just in your head. You have no, been this is an by, actual fear. Yeah, this, this is a fear that you have been advised to internalize by people who professionally tell people what to fear. No, I have. We. I mean, I. Thankfully, I have amazing people yeah. that represent me. Right. That advise me to listen you can't say this because then this will happen that's what i mean i just don't want people listening to this to think that you're just some paranoid weirdo who thinks no, no. That the world is out to get you that's i'm not i'm not i'm not paranoid this is like factual information that people have told me like your name has come up in x situation and then equally people that pretend to care about me or my business then try to play me because they think I'm a fucking idiot, mm-hmm. right? Because they think I don't have that representation. Because they right. think I don't have people guiding me, saying like, don't do this because this is bad because of X, Y, and Z. Right. And then me, and and I'm, I'm also like, I'm very, my belief in people is like, I don't often, right? Don't often believe in people. Right, I don't. Yeah. At least not in, in this scope of the world, like the political scope of the world. But me saying, no, this this is a good guy. He's a good person, right? And then come to find out that this person that advised me not to do X, Y, and Z was fucking right. It, it blows my fucking mind. Because all the people out there saying, well, this politician's great and this politician's that and this. No, man. So let me ask you this. Just to, because some of that might sound to some people kind of like, generic on some level so let's talk about this yeah sad sadly i have to be generic because right. i have to worry about my 60 employees right. that care about their fucking job right so let's talk about this sure how because you haven't been a business owner compared to some other people for all that long right how has being in this position changed the way that you see let's just limit it to government i was going to say the world but that's a stupid question change the way that you see government at all levels i used to be a kid that was very hopeful i remember my first uh one of my first cook jobs the sous chef i was like you know i'm I'm always very uh, jacked up about a lot of things i was all like excited about doing something and whatever he was like you know you have that uh that like shine in your eye that everything is pure right and I used to look at politics somewhat the same way because I felt like we, as a culture, came here and we were afforded an opportunity and this thing, freedom and blah, blah, and something that our grandparents created for us and so on and so forth and this and that. And then come to find out that albeit very free, the people that we elect aren't necessarily good people. And that that happened over time. It happened from... You know, being a line cook, making fucking 10 bucks an hour, nine bucks an hour, whatever it was, to then growing to be a business owner that the things I say have further implications because people don't like to get their fucking feelings hurt because they're soft, Mm -hmm. right? They don't like to get their feelings hurt. They don't like to say, like, how dare you uh, oppose me? I mean, I don't know. How different is that from what our grandparents fled? I mean, it's, I mean, they're not killing anybody. Right. Yeah. You know, but. In essence, like if you threaten to close my business, you are killing me in a lot of ways. Like, how do I, how do I provide for my family? How do I provide? How do my employees provide for their family? It's just a lot of things. So, yeah, I mean, I'm disheartened. I don't I don't believe in the political system uh, the way that a lot of people do. I don't believe in hope. Uh, we have a new hope. Do we really? Would you just? I mean, because that that might sound over the top cynical. When you say you don't believe in hope, you mean in the political context. For sure. Right. I just don't want people to think that you're here like, you know, about... No, I mean, I'm, we're talking about politics. Right. As a, as, a, as a subject. I don't believe in hope sounds like the start of a terrible emo song. Well, I mean, we were talking about bad music with Mario. That's true. Yeah. Loga. I don't believe in hope. 
<laughs> that I may believe. be the title to Mario's next album. But I believe in bag beans. <laughs> <laughs> and logas. Logas and bag beans, but hope I've lost all hope. I don't know. I just like and I and I hate to sound like that guy is like, but, oh. by the way, just to give you a sense of like how little emo music I'm making this reference and my best emo version of that line was I don't believe in hope. <laughs> That was my I think transition there. If you want to look at the the bare essence of emo music, okay, it would be dashboard confessional. We've made a hard turn here. I know, I know. I, but we're just talking about music and emo music. So yeah. dashboard confessional. Dashboard confessional. I think that would be if you really want to cry yourself to sleep, that would be the yeah, move. That's the move. Yeah. Uh okay, so that's the impact that being a business owner has had. I think you. just being like a grown up and having my own opinion too. Like I think a sure. lot of you know, when you look at things, but would you would you call being a business owner sort of like a a turning point or the thing that is played the biggest role in you're getting to where you are? Now? And if not, what other thing might have contributed? No, I mean, uh, the being a business owner has changed a lot about me as a human. Sure, I'm just saying Whether, political because that's where we've been. Yeah, no, I know. I'm just talking about in general, like um, being cynical about lots of things when you're a business owner is very easy because you see the bad side of so many things you know, whether it be you know humans or politics or financials or i don't know there's a lot of like bad side right and that's why i tell people all the time that they're like um uh, when they're like oh you know you you own the restaurant it must be like so great <laughs> you have a caddy <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you get your own jerseys. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely like, there's pros to it, but when you, uh, and just to not talk about politics for like yeah. two seconds, yeah, I got into this thing about for food. I got into this because I love food, and I love the, the essence of what like food brings to the table, if you will. You know, like the community, the family, the love, the passion, the purity in it. I see a lot of that thing, those things in food. And then when you become a business owner, things change. Right. And um, it's, I wouldn't say it's disheartening, but it's tough. You know, you struggle a lot internally, two sides of yourself. You'd rather be doing this, but you're doing this. And then what are you really doing? And then it's like, uh, it's a struggle. And I think at this point in my career, five years in, in the growth that we've had, there's a lot of that, like internal struggle of like the business side. Yeah. And then... Along with the business side, you become you get into this political side too, which I never imagined ever in a million years. I'd be sitting with uh, political types talking about the future of things. Because who the fuck am I? Fucking you know, like I'm a fucking line cook that worked saute and grill his entire life, and um, I I just like what I like. So what? Why are we having this conversation? Right. And then at the end of the day, I figure. Not only why, but I need to be having this conversation because the health of my company, myself, and my employees 100% has to do with political impact of the shit that you motherfuckers do. Mm -hmm. And as you motherfuckers, I'm talking about local politics. Right. In general. So just to – I know that you're not going to talk about who you voted for, uh, but – as a general rule, I, I like for people who are listening to these things to be able to contextualize. Because one of the things that I don't appreciate, and this kind of touches on some of the things that we've talked about so far, about the way that media, especially in the U.S., mm-hmm. deals with politics is this sort of fiction that as long as you don't acknowledge your perspective, then it doesn't exist and it doesn't matter. So I can like you, to be can very you explain open. explain that? So there's... Um, and, and again, to sort of provide a little bit of context, before uh, we embarked on this Bancom podcast adventure, sure, uh, and we're sponsored by Croqueta Doorstops, uh, I I made my my living covering the cigar industry at Cigar Snob Magazine. Uh, before that, I was uh, in marketing sort of out of necessity because I was living in Wisconsin for personal reasons. And then uh, before that, I was uh, I graduated from the Missouri uh, Journalism School. So... I have like some exposure to uh, journalists in the U.S. from like that angle, right? So like I uh, studied under people who you know had accomplished a lot of shit, you know, uh, Pulitzer winners and people who are leaders in their field, whatever. 
And by that, I mean, I think that it's a very American idea to think that your journalists should be <coughs> impartial and not have perspectives and be like, there's a sort of fiction of objectivity, right? That as if like journalists were somehow able to divorce themselves from their human side that of course engages with these issues they're covering mm -hmm. in a human way. So all of this is to say that I, I tend to, and this is part of my like soft approach to datemag.com, approach these things from like a very Latin American perspective, which I think is very you know, part of Miami media in that, in Latin American journalism, it's more common to just say, like, listen, this is where I'm coming from. Take what I'm saying from this, with this, through this lens, and do with that what you will. So by that, and that's part of why I'm asking these questions about, like, what were the things that led you to where you are, et cetera, et cetera. For me, I, I sort of, like, half tongue-in-cheek talk about uh, my experiences living in Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin specifically, which is like one of the more, most progressive places in the country. And also my experiences going to Cuba as having radicalized me. And I am like always the most libertarian person in the room wherever I go. I'm a, an anarchist, a anarchist nutcase. 100%. Uh, and to me, I think that what you're describing is very much in line with the the things that that led me there right where th there were two things that i think sort of three things i'll lay out the three things uh, lay them is, out this unpack is, them all this is coming i want to unpack to becoming a podcast about me unpack all the things about you losing the senior presidency yeah right well oh man so four things uh no the the three the three things that i very often point to is like these were the things that brought me to where i am in my head are one, a uh, personal romantic relationship that I had in Wisconsin. That was the reason I was there. Hmm. Uh, and it came to it, Madison, Wisconsin is a very, very left leaning place. Uh, is it, it? It is. It's the. I'm it's shocked. It's among the most left leaning places. Really? In the country. How many electoral it's, votes do they have? Uh, well, Madison specifically. The oh, rest okay. of Wisconsin is pretty conservative. Okay. But Madison is like the birthplace of American progressivism. Mm. Uh, and it got to a point where she was actually asking me to stay home for like social law school functions. She was a law student. Uh, because even though it's not like I showed up at places with a fucking bullhorn, like, hey, everybody, this is all the crazy shit I think. Uh, I mean, you are in essence a bullhorn, but go on. But no, but people would bring it up. That was like the conversation at parties, right? Like I, I'm, I'm also happy to just fucking smoke a cigar and have a drink with somebody and talk shit. But that's what people there would talk about. And I would participate openly. And it got to a point where like when I wasn't around, I was the topic of conversation. And it was enough of an issue. She would ask me to stay home <laughs> for things that other people were bringing their significant others. <laughs> that's amazing. And I was like, <laughs> this is fucking insane. So that was one thing. The second thing was uh, going to Cuba several times. Mm -hmm. And there were exchanges. Actually, this is sort of restaurant relevant. We were talking about paladares, which for those who are not familiar, paladar is, is, paladar is the term that is often used uh, for independent restaurants in Cuba. And they sort of like open and close the spigot on how many new licenses they issue and what have you, basically based on how much economic pressure they're feeling and how much freedom they need to let people have. But I was having a conversation with somebody there. It was, I can tell you who they were. They've come up in, they came up in the podcast actually with, uh, maybe in the conversation after we turned off the mics with uh, Rosa Maria Paya. But it was Orlando Luis Padolazo, who's a, a, a poet and a, a, I think it's fair to call him a dissident poet in Cuba. Uh, Ciro Rodriguez, who is the bassist in a band called Porno para Ricardo. I like that. Uh, That's a good name. Uh, so the reason they call it this is a little sidebar. The reason it's called Porno para Ricardo is, uh, I, I, I love the story of this name. It's called Porno para Ricardo because those, that's like the most anti-Cuban communist name they could come up with because porn is like the most decadent, like you're not supposed to do this if you're the new communist man thing. And they call it, they made up Ricardo. They call it para Ricardo because it's not just for them. It's for this individual, which is not supposed to exist. So they called it Porn for Ricardo. That's love the name it. of their punk band. I love it. Uh, 
And, and Claudia Cadelo, who was a, a blogger in Cuba. And so we were talking about all this stuff, and I brought up, like, how angry it made me, like, the exorbitant confiscatory rates that people were taxed and, and the fees they were charged to run restaurants out of their homes. And it wasn't, like, in a defense of the restaurant thing in Cuba. It was more just sort of, like, out of curiosity, and it sort of challenged my thinking, where they asked me, like, okay, but what about corporate taxes in the U.S.? Like, what if somebody's charged, I don't know, 30%? 15%, 40%, 50%, whatever it is. How do you justify that? And at the end of the day, like the more I thought about it, the more I realized like I can't. I can't justify it. Hmm. I can't. There is no rational argument for it's okay to steal this much but not that much. Yeah. And that's how I came to this place of like it's all immoral. Yeah, I mean all that is uh, based off of economics. Wouldn't you say? Uh, sort of, but I think it's more. Well, ta- based- I mean, taxing is economic. Yeah, but I think. It, but to me, it's more a moral question. So the moral question is, <clears throat> how do you accomplish that, right? Because the economics is more like, what is the benefit and the cost? The moral question is, if I'm telling you that if you don't give me this money to have a restaurant mm. or to do whatever, I'm going to come and first I'm going to give you a letter. And then if you wipe your ass with a letter, then I'm going to come and give you a stern (coughs) warning. And at some point, it gets to the point (coughs) where I'm telling you, like, you're going to prison. And if you run away from me when I try to put you in prison for not giving me this money, I'm pulling my gun. And if I pull my gun and you pull yours to defend yourself, I'm going to shoot you. And the law says I'm in the right because I have a badge. If I'm not willing to say that's what I would do personally, right, like... There's somebody in need elsewhere, and I say, Mike, give me all your fucking money. And you tell me no, and then I shoot you. Of course, everybody's like, Nick, what the fuck are you doing? You can't just go around shooting people because you, you want their money. Right. I'm not, I, I, can't, I, I can't connect the if A then B dots in my head of, oh, well, then it's okay so long as somebody has an ID badge that says they're with the IRS. Hmm. That, to me, I, I can't square that circle, and that's how I end up in this crazy libertarian anarchist place. And living in Madison where I sort of experienced the intolerance of, of like, real passionate statism. Mm. And then going to Cuba, where people who were, like, really, they'd spent a lot of time thinking about this shit, really challenged my notion of, like, Cuba is not good, but the way you do it over there is okay. And I realized, like, no, it's not okay. It's maybe a little closer to okay, but it's not okay. Right. Uh, and that's how I end up where I am. That was a very long-winded way of me giving the person listening to this some kind of context so that they understand, like, where the two people having this conversation are coming from. Because I think it's useful because maybe somebody will hear both of those and think, you guys are both full of shit. You don't make any sense. But I think it's useful to, like, not pretend that we're not coming from a place, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, So, anyway, we've, we've kind of gone down this political road. It's been a while since we talked about the Rona. Let me ask you a question. Oh, sure. Yeah, go wherever you want. This is Your name is on the sandwich. Let me ask you a question. Do you like pancakes? I, if you put a pancake in front of me, I'll enjoy it. I will not go out of my way for a pancake. Your pancake. How do you dress your pancakes? How do I dress? Yeah, like what do you want in your pancake? Um, I think how people like their pancakes says a lot about a person. So just go on. Yeah, I, I would say... Uh, I definitely don't want to slather it. Like, I don't want to go over the top with, with syrup. Right. Uh, probably more butter than most people would do. Well, and I okay. also like the idea of some kind of jam. Hmm. Like, I love blintzes. Oh, let's not get into that. That's a whole other podcast. That's, That's a whole other animal. animal. Blintz, I got a thing. So, I, so a good friend of mine, uh, Lauren Tussey, who is a a member of our armed forces. Uh, Happy Veterans Day, Lauren Tussie. Uh, A good friend of mine from college. Uh, And she did a lot of Swedish pancakes. So I spent a lot of time at her house with her family uh, making Swedish pancakes. And I'm a huge fan of the idea of, like, taking a thin pancake and rolling cream cheese and jam in it. Yeah. I love a blintz. Yeah. I'm a fan. Yeah. I mean, we've talked a lot about pancakes in the last week, you and I. So tell people this political pancake. I like philosophical flapjack, but you're going with political pancake. We 
Uh, we are starting a series. By the way, I'm going to move this thing because for camera. There you go. That's, that's good. We are starting this thing called uh, Pancakes with Politicians. And by starting a series, you mean when there's a politician, that's just what we'll say. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring pancakes. No, I know, but it's not a new thing. It's part of Panko Podcast. Yeah, yeah. We're going to start a thing called, you know, Pancakes with Politicians by Panko Podcast. Right? So we're going to try to get some of these political types um, on the show, and we're going to talk to them about pancakes. Yeah. And how they like their pancake. Right. I feel like a pancake humanizes somebody. I feel like the fact Tell that... Tell me why. Why more than other foods? Because you... I just... Forget about other foods. People can get, you know, enamored with a cake. But just like pancakes, it's just this like homey, loving feeling of warm butter maple syrup thing. So you could be like just like red, just red with how mad you are that Trump is losing, right? Okay. And you're just like just – and then you could see a pancake and then get very happy. Okay. Or – you can be the other side and just not shut the fuck up about how happy you are that Biden won. Right. And then you see a pancake and you stop talking. So it's not so much that you think the pancake says something about a person as much as is that you think it brings the conversation to, uh, hey, th- there's also pancakes. Let's talk about your pancake. Yeah. That's more of what it is for me. Yeah. Because people, you know, any political type is going to want to sit here and tell me about why they believe what they believe. Right. But then there's a pancake. So tell me about – so is the Chugs pancake – No, that's my ultimate pancake. That's your ultimate pancake. You know, there's – I will a, say uh, uh, among pancakes that are just pancake butter syrup, that is – easy. and I'm, I'm not just blowing smoke up your ass. That is easily the best pancake I have ever had. I had it once. And I don't feel a need to have it again because that's how I feel about pancakes. I would rather have a bucket of those fucking breakfast potatoes you guys make. Oh, yeah. Those are good. Those potatoes are – Outrageous. Waxman potatoes is what they're called. I don't know what's going on. Created by Jonathan Waxman. Jonathan, I'm sorry. I don't care. I just want to eat them. uh, Barbudo. Anyways. um, Meaning that's like his recipe? Yeah. Okay. And then I worked for his chef for many years. And then that's where I learned how to make those potatoes. But the Chugs pancake is to me the ultimate pancake. Okay. Because it's made with lots of butter. Mm -hmm. And it's just like... I don't like a lot of stuff on my pancake. Yeah. I don't want any stuff. We're just going to do this for Nick because he no, won't it's, stop. It's, it's, it's not that We're it just going to put it over here. We're going to put it right. No, this is fine. This is better, right? At this, your mouth. Jeez. That's what should be Christ. happening. That's, that's it. That's all I want. I just want to wow. put it at your mouth. So like uh, the Chugs pancake, cast iron, lots of clarified butter, a little bit of char, a little brown, crispy, fluffy. Yeah. And then just warm maple syrup at, at the base of the plate. I'll, me, because I'm, I'm a lush when it comes to maple syrup. I love maple syrup. I'll put more. But then just butter on top. That's the thing. For me, the maple syrup, the, the pancake as you serve it, to me, is the perfect just butter and maple syrup pancake. But that's what I mean. Somebody who could have won an election or lost an election or believe in a thing or whatever could come ready to tell me how much they support Donald Trump. Or tell me how much they support Joe Biden. Or tell me how much they support Carlos Jimenez or Francis Suarez, whatever. But then you give them a pancake. And then they just, they're just quiet. Uh, so I, I invited, um, I had a brief Instagram exchange okay. with Shane Hazel, uh, who would like to do this podcast. Shane Hazel just ran for governor as a libertarian in Georgia. Oh, nice. And he's being accused oh, yeah? of, oh, because boy. he was the libertarian, in Georgia, in order to win, you need to win 50% plus one. Right. And neither the Republican nor the Democrat got 50%. Ah. So everybody's mad at Shane because they call him the spoiler because oh. he's spoiled. Now they have to go to a runoff and they're doing a second vote. Everybody has to go vote again. And his response, you would love this, even if you don't agree with him on things, although I think you would probably agree with him on a bunch of shit. Uh Shane's, Shane's quote when, uh, in response to complaints that he's a spoiler uh, by Republicans and Democrats was, give me all your tears. They are delicious. That's a good one. I like that. He sounds like a WCW person. 
So, uh, so Shane, Shane is a. Uh, but that uh, equally bothers me. Why does it? What like? Why is there only a two-party system? Why is it you have to be a Democrat or Republican? Why can't we be something else, yeah. too? Like I don't. There's lots of things with Republicans that someone could disagree with. There's lots of things with Democrats people could disagree with. What about another thing? I think, but you can be another thing. I, I, I know that you could be another thing, but it's like, why is he the fucking spoiler? He's another thing. Yeah. Good for him. That's what but I'm saying. Give me all I, your tears. They're delicious. I just, I don't, I like, I don't totally understand why that, that to me, that in essence is very American to be right. another thing, to yep. be something totally different. So here, just because yeah. you don't agree or you don't agree doesn't mean that I'm wrong. It just means that I'm free to disagree with both you motherfuckers, and that's just where I stand. So these are the, again, I'm taking, I'm, I'm, it's all this jack you keep giving me, and it's not in a red solo cup, so I don't know how to measure it. One glass. Uh, no, man, no, I, this is my second jack. All right, go on. I have the, the first one's right here. All right. Uh, these are my three crusades. That I will go on. Oh, man. My Such three crusades word, when I will go, that I intend to go on when the dust has settled on this and people aren't just thinking about this Trump Biden shit. One of them is abolishing the I voted sticker. <laughs> uh, I think it's a travesty of justice that the I voted sticker even exists and that it's funded publicly. I think considering all the technology that's around, that you can just virtually put a sticker on yourself because you only want the sticker for Instagram. Go fuck yourself if you want me to pay for your sticker. I have all kinds of problems with it. That's one thing. The second thing is qualified immunity. I'm getting back on that thing, and I'm, I'm not with gonna, you. I'm not going to shut the fuck up about it. And the third thing, I don't buy the idea that we are in a two-party system. I think that there are, in the sense of like the government system, I think that there are forces outside of government that benefit from there being a two-party system. For sure. That like that we're all so fixated on this fiction that we live in a two-party system. But we don't. Because anybody in Congress right now can change their affiliation to a third party. And that's just what it is. Now Now there are three parties. In fact, right now there's a sitting congressman, Justin Amash, from Michigan, who's a libertarian. He switched from Republican to, to libertarian. Mm -hmm. My other crusade will be... Well, who's, who are you going to give that to? What's going on? Oh, that's your bill? Oh. oh. Uh, <laughs> my, my third crusade will be uh, directed at journalists. And here's what I mean by that. The Commission on Presidential Debates organizes all the presidential debates. Mm -hmm. They are run... Bipartisans. It's effectively uh, a collaboration between Republicans and Democrats, and they both have an interest in maintaining a duopoly on the debates. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is fine, because if you're the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, your obligation is to your members. You're supposed to look out for them in the same way that your obligation, even if you might feel some obligation and some sentimental thing to, like, food and the... Ultimately, as a business owner and as whatever your title is at Ariad Hospitality, your obligation is to that company and to your employees and to the people that are involved and invested. What I have a problem with is that when the Commission on Presidential Debates says, these are the terms of our debates, we are going to exclude third parties unless they meet this and that condition, that the CNNs and MSNBCs and Fox Newses and Miami Heralds of the world say, Okay, no problem. If this were the NFL and uh, Omar Kelly was told, hey, you know what? When you're in the locker room, you're not allowed to talk to Tua. Okay. It would be a fucking shit show. People would be up in arms like if we were living in Castro's Cuba. Hey, sure. Uh, Ed Reed just joined our live. Oh, Say what's hi. up, Ed? Ed, uh, with whom to... Mark Have you gotten the hat that we sent? Nick sent a hat, and I don't know if you got it. I don't know if you got it either. That's like, I don't... We gave, we sent a hat, you said you sent it, and Ed, Ed never got it. Listen, I'm not the Postal Service. I don't know why you gave it to me in the first well, place. Well, they were defunded. <laughs> <laughs> the Postal Service was defunded, and that's why, Ed, mailboxes. that's why Ed hasn't gotten I his hat. I blame Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Ed, if you don't have your hat, it's Trump's fault. <laughs> Biden 2020. That's probably accurate, though. Or Jorgensen, whatever. That's, probably that's who accurate. I voted for. By the way, yeah, I want to provide. I voted for Jorgensen. 
Uh, I wasted my vote. Sorry, everybody. Harambe. Uh, yeah, well, and Harambe. Everybody take your dick out. Yeah. Uh, so, anyway, all this is to say, my third crusade will be to uh, harass the journalists <laughs> into saying, no, we will not do these debates be- unless we can do them however the fuck we want to do them. You know, this is how crazy it is. The Commission on, Presid- on Presidential Debates disqualifies people from the debates if they do non-sanctioned debates, which means I both get. Tulsi Gabbard and, and Bernie Sanders did, let's say, Joe Rogan's podcast. Had they done it at the same time, they would have disqualified themselves from presidential debates. That, to me, is, is insane. It's hobsquabble. It's complete hobsquabble. And Good. I think that it's really on the Anderson Coopers of the world and the Brett Bears of the world and the whoever would host it if we were uh, if there was a debate in Miami and the Miami Herald was involved of the world to say, no, if you want to play that stupid game, we're not going to be involved because we have our own set of ethics. And that's who gets off scot-free. All of these journalists who pretend because what they really end up wanting is, no, this is super cool. We have these two parties who basically duopolize the debate process. Mm -hmm. We get a free show. We're investing in all these lights and all this shit. And we don't have the stones to say, fuck you. Fuck you if you think that this is the way it's going to function. We talk to whoever we want. If we want to invite, invite, invite the third party, the third party will be here. But that never even comes up. I would even be satisfied if they started the debate with, welcome to tonight's presidential debate. All these assholes on the stage have made it so that this third party can't be here. Now on to the questions. I would be satisfied with that even. But they won't do that. And those are the people we should be mad at, I think. Because the parties are supposed to look out for them. Just like you're supposed to look out for Ariad Hospitality Group. And I'm supposed to look out for Dade. And and Ed is supposed to look out for Ball Hawk Incorporated or whatever the fuck it is. UM. He's the chief sure, of staff. Yeah, exactly. He's supposed to look out for UM. Right. Like, that's what you're supposed to do. But these journalists who want to then grandstand and pretend that like, oh, we're the fourth estate and we're here for you and Trump is calling us fake news and whatever the fuck. And then meanwhile, you're pulling this bullshit, collaborating with this insane duopoly just so you can have your dog and pony show with all your lights and your fancy stage and all that bullshit. When you could do the same thing on Zoom and actually give us useful information instead of going along with the insane just the fact that the trumps and bidens of the world can set the terms that oh you know the two the two candidates came to these terms no why 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 is that the thing why is that the thing why isn't whoever's hosting the debate saying no you know what you talk for this long and you talk for this long and this is how we think it'll be productive and if you don't like it go fuck yourself but that's not the way it works because what they want is the free show they want the low-hanging fruit they want the, to put it in Miami Cuban. It's not Miami. It's also Cuban. They want that mango ajito of just like, oh, you gave us the free format? Like, cool. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll pretend that it's okay. That's my third crusade. He's, Stickers, qualified immunity, and debates. Qualified immunity was just quoted in an article about how it saved a sitting political figure yes. because he could not be tried by a local institution. Correct. Because of qualified immunity. And we're not saying his name on purpose. Absolutely not. We're absolutely not going to say his name. No. We're not. Okay. Yeah. Because he's one of those devious types. But I will say, it's also not... I'm not going to say his name. But the fact that he's protected by qualified immunity is not his doing. So to acknowledge it is not a knock on him. It's just the fact of the matter. No, I know, I know. I just but don't want to. I don't. I don't want to get into it because it's but not something it. that affects my business, and I, I don't it. want it to because I don't even like the business that he's affecting. So, you know, I, it's interesting that we talk about crusades, right? Because my crusade in life was about food, and I feel like the crusade changes so much when you go back to that like uh, conversation of being a business owner. That conversation about being a business owner. Your crusade changes to protecting your business, protecting your employees, protecting your people. And it's like you're so far removed from the thing that you got into it to begin with. I got into this because I love my food. and I love the food that we produce and I love all the things about it. And I find myself rarely talking about that anymore. It's been at least a month or so, probably, 
since we really ju- since we did one of these, which means it's been at least that long since we talked very much about versos, not just versos, but just your food in general. But I think versos has probably become uh, sort of a vehicle or a, a, a some kind of a driver in your food and where that's going or headed or been. Uh, I think I think so. L- let's let's just kind of transition to that. Like talk talk a little bit about in the last. It's probably been like four weeks. Uh, you know where where is the food and where's your head on food and all that. Well, uh, it's an interesting topic because, like I just said, the crusade for me, if you will, for lack of a better word, I guess, yeah, has always been about food and the Miami dining scene and uh, the community as a whole. But this year, it's like. It's a lot more than that. It's a lot more than just those things because in reality, it's about survival and it's about getting through. There's more for rent signs on restaurants than I've ever seen. And then equally as such, there's more restaurants that I've ever seen opening, which only means that there's big bank money going into real estate uh, for hope of a better future. And they're just pouring that money into, you know, real estate and restaurants and big names and so on and so forth. And the food itself oftentimes gets lost. And the food itself, um, I think, gets kind of forgotten because at least from the chair that I'm sitting in, I'm fortunate enough that I have incredible people around me that still have their eye on the prize. And they're putting out, I think the best product that we've ever put out, me as a leader, sometimes I feel like I'm not doing my best job. And because, and not because I I don't care. It's because, um, some like you can't see five feet in front of you because you don't know what you're going to walk into tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what new government law is going to happen or new miracle vaccine or new whatever the fuck is going to happen tomorrow. So it's like, what are we planning for? What is the menu change that we're doing? Why are we doing it? I'm looking at farmers struggling every day. I'm looking at, um, you know, uh, a uh, an employment pool that's super depleted. And I don't know where all the cooks went. I mean, there wasn't that many to begin with, but now there's even less. Um, and I'm looking at just uh, a food community that's hurting, and not just in Miami, around the country and around the world. You know, incredible restaurants have closed, and I think they will continue to close. And fear is a huge factor for me. Uh, I fear for tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, because the implications of what's happening right now will reverberate for a very long time. Mm-hmm. And we could blame it on Corona. We could blame it on politics. We can blame it on whatever the fuck we want. In essence, we have a serious fucking problem. And the problem is much deeper than um, the fact that we have a 12 o'clock curfew. The, the problems are fundamental right now. Economics, uh, how the people of the world are feeling. And it's, and it's fucked up because I used to... And I still do love food and coming up with new dishes and the growth of things and and fighting through it. But I will say, and I'm sure a lot of people would agree with me, I'm exhausted. Mm -hmm. The community is exhausted. Wondering if people will show up to eat. Wondering if tomorrow we can even open. Wondering if... Uh, is there going to be a restaurant stimulus thing, uh, uh, fucking a huge bankroll to save all restaurants? What does that even mean? Right. I don't I don't know what that means. When people tell me what that means, I don't know what that means. Like, um, so I think, yeah, like our tasting menu series has been a highlight. The I'd say one of the few highlights of the whole year, but at the same time, It's just, it's a moment in time. Yeah. It's like a moment in space. Everything else is hazy and you're in this weird kind of fog. And then we have this like beautiful night and you feel incredible. And then 
you go, you enter in a fog the next day. And life continues to be, it's kind of like getting a high, right? For anyone that's ever done drugs, how it works is you enter this euphoric state and you're very happy. And it could be drugs or alcohol and you're very happy and things are going great. And then you go to sleep and you wake up and shit sucks again. Mm -hmm. And I would say that the tasting menu is that moment for me and for a lot of my staff. Because then we go back to life the next day. And life the next day is weird. Yeah. You know? So uh, there was a point, I think, in like January, February, I felt very confident in my food direction. I felt very confident in like the state of my growth. And then that was like stunted by the world. And it was stunted by so many other factors of just like this weird life that we're living right now. So we forced our way through to do this tasting menu series. And I think it was, and it's great. And it's like that moment uh, of time that we all kind of like live for and we work our asses off for. But then we go back. To the next day. Mm-hmm. And I think that's partly, it's like a, it's, it's this weird thing. Yeah. So I don't know the real state of my own food. You know, the real state of my own food is, um, and our food as a company, I think we're doing very well. But I think we're doing very well and fighting through so many things that not only am I exhausted, because I, I, I go to sleep tired and I wake up tired. Because I don't fucking know what the day holds for me. It's not just me. It's everyone that works around me. And everyone that's working very hard to continue to do this thing. Um, Whatever it may be. Whether wait tables or be a busser or be a bartender. Whatever it is. We're in this weird like moment. And they're all like. It's almost like the, the hamster wheel. You know. We don't know where we're going. We're just running Mm -hmm. because someone is going to dictate to us what we have to do eventually. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, the coronavirus is still a problem. I mean, everything is still a problem. Everything is a problem. (laughs) I've not, I don't know if I, in my 35 years of life, I've ever lived a time that it's like everything is a problem. Everything from like how we deal with guests to the coronavirus pandemic to local politics to uh, the supply chain when it comes to food to um, staffing to uh, fundamentals of financials when it comes to running a business because now everything is going to change. Um, I don't know. I mean, food is almost the last thing sometimes that I think about. And it's a sad place to be in because... It is the thing that makes me the happiest, at least right. professionally. So um, the state of the food is exhausted. Yeah. The state of the food is worn and tired and fighting. But the reason why, there she is, the reason why we do those things is because, um, Emma, I'll take one more. One more? Yeah. That you want to know? Sure. Yeah. yeah. The reason why we do yes. those things is because we don't really have anything else. So Professionally, I would say. I think that's uh, not necessarily the subject of minimum wage, sure. which was a, a, a constitutional amendment in Florida that passed in this last election. But one of the things that struck me, and I've been meaning to ask you just for your thoughts on this. Sure. When we were like in the thick of the COVID shutdowns, Mm -hmm. I saw just as sort of an outside observer, the restaurant industry really sort of mobilize at least online, which I think as much as anybody could mobilize because that's where we all lived Mm -hmm. around certain messages and initiatives. And, you know, we need this kind of help from the government. We need this, we need that. (coughs) And then when I when I saw how wide the margin was, and admittedly, like it, it wasn't because I think we all got kind of caught up in the Trump Biden shit. Yeah, and we, there was other things on the ballot. There were other things that we didn't talk about nearly enough. Like things should be voted for twice. 
Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I guess the, the observation that I'm asking you to comment on, and maybe there's stuff I just don't get, mm-hmm. is it seems to me that especially now, like this is the worst imaginable time for a business owner to have to contend with the specter of $15 an hour minimum wage. Yeah. And I know past guest on the podcast is Zach uh, Stern. So Zach he baked Baker. it into the model. That's what he said on the Miami Herald. Uh, I didn't read the Herald piece, but I did see his Instagram post. And what comes to my mind as an amateur armchair economist here is, yes, you were able to do that. You were able to implement this minimum wage for your company. But it also serves as a differentiator. At some point, and so what it ends up doing in the marketplace, and I'm sure that you've experienced some version of this on one side or the other of the equation, is there are people who will say, Okay, that's the wage I'm getting here, and that's going to affect whether I take a job driving X distance or working under such and such a person or sure. whatever. It To say it worked for my company in a landscape where it wasn't the rule mandated across the board is not quite the same as saying, and so it will work if we all do it. Right. The math changes. Yeah. And so the question slash observation that I have is, when we spoke to Jose Mending, he, he touched on it himself uh, briefly, like about what a problem a uh, mandated $15 an hour minimum wage could be. It seems to me like there would probably be pretty close to consensus among business owners about whether that's a good idea. And I think the consensus would be, no, it's not. Even in companies where they're already paying more. Right. I mean, we, so the, uh, the, the, like, the question for me is like, what I found myself thinking, and I'll, I'll end it here, was... Everybody was so quick to, like, there was graphic design and there were messages and there were proposals and all this shit around, like, we need X money. But I didn't see all these same business owners who I think if you polled them would all say, this is a bad idea right now. I didn't see them saying, hey, everybody, don't hurt us like this. This is not the time. Right. I would also say a lot of people probably didn't think that was going to pass. You think that was it? Like I think that was it. I mean, you know, uh, forget about just the restaurant community. Just business in general. Sure, yeah. The world agreed to now pay 30% more than they did previously for everything. Florida did anyway. Right. Yeah. They agreed that they're okay with paying 30% more for everything. Yeah. I think that's the bottom line. I don't I know that us as a company we don't pay anyone minimum wage or what the minimum wage was. Um but to stay competitive, you I mean, you don't pay the minimum wage now, but when minimum, minimum wage is $15 as a as a someone who's competing for labor, mm-hmm. now you're in a different situation. Right. And I think you know, Danny Meyer tried to change it several times when he tried to get away from the tipping policy and so on and so forth. And there was a lot of failure in that. I just tell the consumer, like, you know, I mean, it's cool. 15 bucks an hour is cool. That's fine. I mean, we're just all going to have to pay more for everything. We just all have to be okay with that. And then in five years from now, don't complain about it. If we're all okay with it now, in five years from now, everyone needs to be okay with that. And I think... You know, where it really gets me is when that there's kids, younger kids that come straight out of any kind of school for any kind of profession that don't know their ass from their face. And you're going to pay them 15 bucks an hour. I just don't, I don't see that as like a thing. I don't, for me, people earn their stripes. I earned all of my stripes. I used to get paid minimum wage and um, I worked my way out of that and I worked very hard to get away from that. So... I think um, in the topic of minimum wage, just people are going to pay more for things. And I I think that um, if they have a problem with it, then they, I mean, we we all voted for it. So it's like, this is the thing. I, you know, Zach is an interesting situation because his concept conceptually is different than a restaurant doesn't run like a restaurant there's a wholesale department and equally zach as uh as good as he is at his things and as good as he 
treats his people and, you know, it's baked into the bread or the model or whatever. I mean, you know, uh, people walk away from working for him saying that he's X, Y, and Z. It doesn't matter what you pay people. People always walk away with something to say. And that's the bottom line. Right. That's like people, you could pay them 20 bucks an hour, 30 bucks an hour. They're going to have some kind of opinion, whether good or bad. Yeah. So, I, I don't know. Like, when I look at the that whole situation, all I tell people is, you're just going to pay 30% more for everything in five years. Not just food. Everything. Everything. Nothing exists in a vacuum, which I think is lost on a lot of people. If you're If you're okay with that, I mean... Paying more for things means that you're paying more taxes for things, means that we're paying more employee taxes. If anyone wants to tell me that the government did not want that bill to pass, they are mistaken. Yep. Because we, the business owners, pay employee taxes. We pay more. So we're going to pay more now. So you can't look at me and say that the government didn't want, oh, no, we don't want this to pass. Of course they wanted it to pass. There's a lot of layers to that, the whole thing. You're not just like sticking it to the man, to the business owner. No, you're sticking it to the man, quote, unquote, the man, the business owner. And now the government's making more in the process too. Right. So, and all equally at the same time, you, the consumer, is paying more for a product. now. So... There's just, it's a lot of things. Do I think people should make 15 bucks an hour and make more money? I Like I tell my people all the time, I wish I could pay all of my good people a million dollars a year. I wish I could pay them. Of course. I want to pay them everything. I don't want to make anything. I wish I didn't have to pay for shit and I could just live on nothing and I could pay them a million dollars a year. That would be great. Free dozen caddies. That's a good life. But I can't. So, you know, it's... The business dictates. So then there's going to be several things that suffer in the process because all those middle employees that make something function better will now disappear. Right. So now things are going to suffer in whatever industry you're in. Could be whatever. You could be at Shell Lumber. You could be at Home Depot. I think the Shell Lumber reference you brought into the picture here. They don't even... Shout out Shell Lumber. They don't even have an ad on this podcast. Um, That's uh, info at datamag.com. <laughs> I, you know, all the the plethora of people that are working at Home Depot right now to help you with your, uh, I don't know, stupid question about fucking, I don't know, a bandsaw. <laughs> I don't fucking know. Um, there's going to be less of those people Yeah. now. Because the business up top, the guys up top, they're not going to suffer. They're going to trim the fat yeah. around it. Right. And I know that like restaurants, we we technically can't, we would have a lot harder time trimming the fat because then the product would suffer. But the Home Depot product, for instance, will not. The, um, the washing machine, the dryer and the washer are still going to be the same. Right. The fucking grills are still going to be the same. The bandsaw is still going to be the same. But now you're just going to have less people to tell you about the bandsaw or the washer and dryer. Right. So the CEO isn't going to suffer. He's going to find a way around it. He's going to trim all the fat. That's what the CEO does. So do I think the restaurants get affected by it more? Maybe. Um, But I think only time will tell. Yeah. That's – I think that's it. Do you have anything you want to get into before we do our parting spiel? Anything I want to get into. Yeah. I actually thought we should do like another Miami Sports Minute. You have things to say? <sighs> do I ever. Oh, man. Let's do it. Here. Do, do I ever. Talk, you're talking right in. I'm not a part of this. You're talking right in here. <sighs> Let me get out of the way here. For the 35 years that I've been alive, I've been a Miami Dolphin fan. Right? Yeah. For the 35 years... For the 35 years that I've been alive, I've been a Miami Dolphin fan. I, I, I feel like in my crib as a child, I had like a little helmet of the Miami Dolphins. This is probably not true, but I feel like that was the case. 
I am a through and through diehard Dolphin fan. I love the Miami Dolphins. I just and football in general. We are experiencing a time of hope. Not political hope, football hope. The Dolphins right now are sitting at five and three. There's a lot to be said about that statement. This time last year, there was oh, they were one and seven or zero oh and eight, uh, something similar to just dreadful. And right now, if you were to look at the Twitterverse of the Miami Dolphins, which is a very archaic, it's just it's there's there's anarchy in Dolphins Twitter. There's people that will sing to the high heavens that the Dolphins are going to win the Super Bowl, and they do it when they're 1-7, and seven. they do it when they're 3-3, three and three. they do it when they're 0-8, oh they do it all the time. Right now we're living in a place that there's so many things that are good, right? Organization well put together. Chris Greer, I think his name, pretty sure. Very good head coach, Brian Flores. Young quarterback, Tua, solid defense, and an offense that's got zero weapons, right? But they're sitting at five and three. They just beat two very good teams. And all the while, people are already saying that the culture has changed. And I, for one, cannot believe it. And you know why? Because for years, I've been beaten down for believing in a team and then losing. Omar Kelly, which is the great, I, I love Omar Kelly and the work that he does. A lot of people disagree with Omar Kelly, and I cannot be one of those people because I agree with, I'd say, 95% of the shit that he says about the Dolphins. Omar wrote a piece this week saying that he believes in the culture of the Miami Dolphins, and I swear, at the same time, hell absolutely froze over. I don't, I cannot bring myself to a place to once again have hope into a team and then to be let down. This week, they play again and everyone is on the boat saying that they have four very winnable games. I cannot jump on that boat. I, for one, feel very very concerned and I don't know what it's going to take for me to believe at this point because they have so many good things I love Brian Flores I think he's great the defensive schemes are amazing like all the things when I watch the game I'm like that's fucking amazing right all like it's like a team of a bunch of like just they're good but they weren't like the guys right other than the two corners they weren't like the guys They weren't the ones. They're not like the fucking first rounders. You have Ogba that's right now. He's got eight sacks. It's like incredible. Scoop touchdowns. Wilkins, which is like a fucking beast. This guy, Landon Roberts, that just comes in and lays the fucking wood. You have two shutdown corners, even though they got fucking exposed by Kyler Murray. I still can't jump on it. And then you have Tua. I wanted to draft this kid. I think he's fucking incredible. He had a stellar game. And I still have a hard time jumping on the fucking wagon again. Just because I'm a Dolphins fan. And I've been battered for the last 20 years. Since Marino stepped away. We've had 21 quarterbacks. 21 quarterbacks since Marino left. Marino's like 60 now. I don't even know what the fuck's happening. So I'm having a hard time. Right? That's the Dolphins. Then we have the Miami Hurricanes, right? Last year, the Hurricanes did a lot of things that were bad. And this year, they have this quarterback that had one of the most historic games in UM history, right? He had like 420 yards passing. He had 100 yards on the ground. He threw for five touchdowns. It was incredible. They were playing NC State. Again, it's one of those things I want to believe, but I am just I just don't know. I was I was the Hurricanes, you know, when they threw that flag against Ohio State, everything changed. Ever since then everything has changed. Everything's been different. So I don't know. 
I'm still playing the wait and see. And then now, information from the NBA three days ago, the Heat go back to playing basketball on December 22nd. 45 days of rest. And then the biggest insult that I've ever seen by the NBA, Adam Silver, you and all of your fucking cronies, you, all of you, right? The Christmas Day game is the Lakers versus Golden State. We were just in the NBA Finals, man. So in Golden State, the entire team didn't play last year. So then now, instead of that, we have, instead of the Heat, because we were in the Finals, the Miami Heat made it to the finals. I don't know if you guys realize that. We made it to the finals. Okay? Instead of a finals rematch, we were disrespected, and it's Golden State versus the Lakers, which LeBron won't play till the end of January. I don't know if you guys know that because he makes his own schedule. I don't know if you've ever realized he does whatever the fuck he wants. So then there's that. And then our expansion team in soccer made it to the fucking playoffs. And then the Marlins also made it to the playoffs. So I'm in a weird place because I don't know. I don't, I have trust issues with Miami sports. I'm a real Miami sports fan and I have trust issues with all of them. So that's where we're going to leave this. And that was your sports minute with, <laughs> with Mike Beltran. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and – do you have a recommendation or – I'm going to recommend Star Trek Discovery on CBS. I've been watching a little bit of that because of my mom. It's actually ex- – I am a Trekkie. Yeah. Big time. This is the first time I've watched a Star Trek show that made me feel like the first time I watched Jean-Luc Picard on The Next Generation. I go to my mom's house often, my mom and my parents' house to have coffee, and she – is all about. She is also a Trekkie. Oh, yeah? Uh, and Good for the, her. The last thing I saw, it was a pretty fucking cool sequence. The whole, like, time travel suit in oh, the... you're not cut up. You still got time. Oh, that's where she's at. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's season one. Is it? Okay, so she's behind. Yeah. Uh, season so one? Star Trek Discovery. Yeah. Season two now is in episode four, which I just finished. Okay. And this is, again, one of those things, like, I don't have cable in my house, right? Because I think that I'm working the system, but I'm not. The system is actually working me. So CBS, right? CBS All Access. Right. Yeah. Um, it's 10 bucks a month. It, it's 10 10 That's crazy. $10 a month. $10 a month, and I have to wait every week to watch Discovery. Because if not, I would just do a one night, like a a one nighter. So why I got you subscribe? Why don't you just like wait until they're I can't all do, out? I can't do that. I can't oh. do that. I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm sorry. I just I, I really enjoy the show, so I want to watch oh, the fine. show. Good. Yeah. We just got Disney Plus on a free thing for six months. So the Mandalorian, I'm coming for you. I'm fucking coming oh, for man. you. You're gonna. We got some Mandalorian episodes on the horizon here. I can't fucking wait. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm so fucking ready for that shit. God. I'm going to go ahead and... This is I also my, recommend to oh, order the Miami Cooks book by Sarah Liss that I am actually in. There you go. Page 22 in the book, but number one in your hearts. That, nice. That's what done. I sign all the books Tell with. people about the... Is that what you sign them with? Yeah. That's good. <laughs> uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a recommendation. This I'm sorry to people who are not in Miami, uh, but this is a Miami people or people who will travel to Miami recommendation. Loga. <laughs> For all the Logas in Miami. Uh, Kush by Stevens, which oh. might be a little confusing to people. So uh, past guest on the podcast, Matt Kusher of Kush Hospitality, is uh, the proprietor of Stevens Deli, which I guess temporarily is Kush by Stevens. In any case, whatever the fuck that place is, Kush by Stevens and La Cocina, on November 25th, the anniversary of the death of one-time Cuban dictator Fidel Castro is hosting oh. Fuck Fidel Day. Fuck Fidel Day. That's, That's November 25th, 25th, the day before Thanksgiving. Uh, according to the Instagram message uh, or, or image that they have to promote this thing, it runs in the most Miami way imaginable. It runs from 5 p.m. 
until late. <laughs> 5 p.m. to late is Fuck Fidel Day there on November down. 25th at, uh, at Kush by Stevens and La Cocina in Hialeah, La Ciudad Que Progresa. Uh, <laughs> so check out Fuck Fidel Day on November 25th from 5 p.m. to late. Uh, according to this image, they will have pachanga provisions, which will include a Está Fidel bien. Piñata at Ooh. 9 p.m., Live music, free Havana Club shots. This, of course, will be the real Havana Club that is not the communist Cuban Havana Club. No, not the communist one. A Cajachina plate, whatever that is, Pada Sucia punch, <laughs> fuck Fidel cigars, <laughs> Coquito shots. I'm sorry, Kush. I get it, Kush. You're a little Puerto Rican. Coquito on fuck Fidel day. Let's get some crema de vie in there. Thank you. But let's not quibble. Here, I will say I like Coquito better than Crema de Vie, but on Fuck Fidel, on Fuck Fidel Day, come on. Uh, anyway, so do that, uh, and thanks to Kush, uh, for to Matt Kusher, for uh, for doing that thing, because you know he's he's not Cuban himself. I get you know you're in Hialeah, there's an incentive there, but also you didn't have to, and you did, and somebody's doing Fuck Fidel Day, and you know you are the superhero that we all needed, not that. Captain Cush, loser. Loser. Matt Cusher is yeah. the superhero this week. I've been to Cush by Stevens. It's very good. Tell me the difference. What happens now that it's Cush by Stevens and not Stevens Deli? It just has some Cush items. Cool. Done. Nice. And some Stevens items. Nice. Yeah, I get it. So you were Con Artist of the Year 2019. Me? Yeah. Why? With the we're closing chugs, we're not closing chugs. That's that not my fault. That was 2020. It wasn't my fault. No? No. I know, I know. But still. You, I you blame win. the city for everything. All right, fine. Uh, Local elections. Anyway, uh, shameless plugs. Do all your shameless plugs. Bro. Bro. <laughs> Bro. <laughs> I'm going to save that clip, and I don't know how I'm going to use it, but I'm going to drop that bro in a lot of places. <laughs> oh, man. So... We have a tasting next week on uh, Wednesday the 18th. Can people still get in there? We have 10 seats left available. Cool. So get in there. Yeah. Don't waste any time. Run. Yeah. Don't walk. Turn off this podcast. <laughs> turn turn it off. It sucks anyways. Yeah. All, all that's left is Patreon plugs. So. Yeah. But, I mean, go on Patreon. Spend. Uh, give us all your money. No, give give Aria your money first. Give all the people your money. Yeah. Um, I'm going to come in here with some podcast stickers and put them on your maze. <laughs> Brittany would have something to say about that. Um, <laughs> Ariet at Ariet Miami. Stay tuned to Ed Chug's Diner for updates on renovations. At Nave Miami. Uh, soon information about opening, which we are shooting for very, very soon. Very soon. Oh, wow. Very soon. Oh, wow. Huge. <laughs> And come to Ariet. I mean, Ariet is... Uh, it's a cool place. It's the little restaurant that could. Oh, man. That's what I keep telling people. It's a little, little place that just keeps on going. And so, oh, um, give us all your money on Patreon. Yes. So patreon.com <laughs> slash dademag, D-A-D-E-M-A-G. That's where you can go to support what we're doing here at Pancom Podcast as well as the rest of dademag.com. Uh for as little as a buck a month, you can support what we are doing there. Uh, other people are doing it. And I now I have gotten emails that our two uh, credits level uh, Patreon patrons, <laughs> Mabel DeBonsa and Philip Bennett, have merch headed their way. Uh, I think they're each getting a mug. <laughs> so, wow. Yes. Mabel has, uh, she has, an, uh, she has an issue with you, no? She has an issue with me? Yeah, didn't we? Was there a little? Uh, your, I mean, your what Facebook happened? is always lit up with things. But oh, maybe. Uh, first of all, okay. First of all, let me. If you ever want a good time, you know, for a Mabel, good time, go to Nicholas Semenes on Facebook. You know where Mabel? Mabel has a problem with you. <laughs> Why? Because you call her Mabel and not Mabel. Mabel. Mabel de Beunza. Yeah. Mavet de Beunza and I do not see eye to eye on uh, politics sometimes, but Mavet de Beunza and I both see eye to eye on how to say Mavet de Beunza. Mavet. Mavet. Done. So thank you very much, Mavelita. 
<laughs> the mug is on the way to you. In fact, maybe, maybe not. Uh, <laughs> it could also be a tote bag. I don't have time to check my email right now to confirm. We're from. not sure. Yeah. Uh, but anyway. Tote bags are cool. Hey, you know, you put uh, your you, groceries you, you, in there. Put your groceries in there. Everybody knows where your kale, you know, uh, is going to a supporter of Pancom Podcast, uh, datemag.com for all of the datemag things, datemag.com slash Pancom Podcast for all of that podcast. stuff. Leave us reviews. You can leave reviews on Apple Podcasts. Yeah. Tell me also, I suck. I encourage people to say you suck. Tell them, leave tell one me star I suck. reviews specifically saying Mike sucks. That's right. And leave five star reviews saying Nick and Company is your favorite part of the show. Right. Uh, Facebook page also that's a place you can leave reviews if you're not an Apple Podcast Facebook. person. So shout out all Facebook. the all my fa- all my fellow Android people. Uh, Spotify also doesn't have a review function. So if you're a spot if you're an anything but Apple person, go to Facebook and leave your review there. Tell Spotify to, doesn't care about your opinion. Tell people to do all this stuff. Uh, Joe Rogan, we're coming for your money at Spotify. We are. And also. Wait. I'd also like to point out uh, local radio guy, Dan Lebetard. You follow Dan Lebetard? I do. We see this differently. I love what Dan Lebetard just did. I half love it. I fully love it. Okay. So Chris Cote, right? Cody. Cody was fired by ESPN. Who's the son of, um, oh, man, um, there's too many jacks. What's his father's name? Cody who, at the Miami Herald. Greg Cote. Greg Cody. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, I didn't son. know that. That's his son. I didn't know that. So he was let go in this mass thing of uh, layoffs by ESPN. So Dan decided to retain him and that he would pay his salary and give him raise which i found admirable yes i like dan lebitard a lot i think uh i've read a lot of dan lebitard's things i think they're incredible i listened to his show for a long time i don't listen to radio anymore i only listen to podcasts especially panko podcasts it's amazing um you don't listen to this podcast. i don't i don't i hate i hate the, the sound of my own voice um but i thought that that was very cool I agree. The, w- when I say that I half... What's the half that doesn't? Let's go I with do, the anarchist I, I, side. I, I, no, it's not an anarchist issue. Uh, maybe it is a little bit. Um, For sure. It is. W- what I don't like is the... I can appreciate Dan's beef that they didn't let him know it was going to happen. <clears throat> right. But at the end of the day, there's a certain element of it that's like, put yourself... We're talking about a company, right? And, sure. and there was a lot of uh, the. Um, I think it might have even been in Dan's in Dan Lebitard's statement about it, where like you know, there's a humanity and this that, and the other thing. You know as well as anybody, like at some point, yeah, there's a humanity, and there's also the reality of like business viability of keeping. Yeah, it. I get it. And so I think that if it had just been like, listen, the circumstances suck. There's layoffs. I'm going to keep this guy on because he's that important to our show, and that's the statement I'm making. I would be 100% on board with it. When you get into, like, the demonizing these people as if they're inhuman for having laid a guy off, like, dude, there were layoffs and... Yeah, but, I mean, you know, I mean, if you've listened to Lebitard long enough, I mean, there's just certain ways that he says things. I get it, but 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 I think it's part... Like, there's certain ways that he says things and they reflect certain ways that he... I assume, right, if, his, if the way he says things is a reflection of how he sees the world... I don't share that view that, sure. that this was an issue of humanity. I think there's also a humanity to, okay, well, if you keep Chris Cody on, then other people have to feel the effect of his being on. And if it's not but him, it's somebody else. fundamentally, so I, which is correct, I, as a business owner, I yeah. agree with you. The guy on the show did not need to do what he did. Right? No, no, I agree. I I. I can appreciate Dan's keeping Chris on because Chris was such an asset and because they felt he was part of a family. And and honestly, like as a fan of the show, Chris Cody really did bring something to the show. But at the end of the day, there were going to be X number of layoffs at ESPN. And if it hadn't been Chris Cody, it would have been somebody else who even if that somebody else wasn't public, because we all know Chris Cody because that, uh, what, he, what is it called, the shipping container of frightened refugees? is so public but there's other people that in their show even if the listeners and viewers don't know it are part of a family too yeah and it would have been somebody else so 
I very much appreciate Dan's, uh, and I'm, like if I'm his fucking friend, calling him by Dan. Dan Lebetard. Call him Mr. Lebetard. I appreciate Senor Mr. Lebetard. You know, looking out for this guy and saying, like, he's integral to what we do. I could do without some of the, like, you know, I would have appealed to their humanity because if it hadn't been Chris Cody, it would have been somebody else. And then where's the humanity there? But the problem like, with business is that usually you miss <coughs> humanity. I disagree. That's fine. But as, as a business owner, I can tell you that sometimes there's been decisions that I've made that I feel outside of myself. So, like, I understand saying that it's uh, you're lacking humanity. Some people could see it that way. They could perceive it that way. They don't know, like, do I think that the big wigs at ESPN have the same feelings that I do? I don't think so. Fundamentally, I just don't think so. I've had to sit across the table from people that I care about very dearly and uh, that I've known for over a decade, and I've had to let them go. Yeah. The, I feel in that moment that I've lost a piece of my humanity because I feel morally obligated to that person about trying to help them create this livelihood of life. So I understand that statement. Now, again, me little restaurant company in comparison to ESPN is vastly different. So I get the statement. ESPN, maybe they do feel it. Maybe they don't. I don't know. But I know for me, when I've sat in that chair and made that decision, I do feel a part of me just hurt. So and that's, that's humanity. And that's the thing, I think. But, but to I, I don't know that we're disagreeing all that much. I think that humanity includes having to make those difficult decisions where somebody has to get cut out. Yeah. And the humanity is in how that impacts you. And I, I, I don't doubt. Now, at ESPN, there's layers. In the same way that here, there's a certain amount of layers. Like, there, uh, and this is not, this is just a part of human nature. Like, when a decision is closer to you, you feel it on in a different way. So if there are people in this company, in your company, that you deal with more frequently than other people, and because you're a human being, if you had to have that conversation with somebody you dealt with less, you'd feel it differently than somebody you dealt with more. No. It's a small company. Right. So it's different degrees. But sure. Like, but somebody, this is what I'm saying. But somebody, ESPN and me are different. So my point is somebody at ESPN, if Dan Lebetard had, if he was presented with the option of like, should it be Chris Cody or somebody else? He's going to say, no, Chris Cody stays and somebody else I don't know goes. That's humanity too. And I think there's a certain amount of like recognizing that we and this this ties in perfectly with so much of the rest of what we've been talking about. Like it's never going to be perfect. And you're going to there, there's this is where the 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 pragmatic and the human sort of intersect. But acknowledging that your emotions intersect with the pragmatic doesn't mean that you're being an asshole it means that you're confronting reality mm. you know in the same way that like you're not being less human because you let somebody go you're letting somebody go because it's necessary for everyone else being okay and you're making a difficult judgment call it, the fact that it hurts makes it more human not less human part of the job of an owner a business owner a person who directs a business whatever is letting people go right and I think what I've often told younger and, you know, when I say younger, it doesn't need to be by like numeric age. It needs mm -hmm. to be how long you've been in a position. What I often tell younger people is that you need to get over that hump to understand that you have to let people go eventually. Now, you don't have to not feel an emotion towards it, but you need to understand that it needs to get done, right? Sure. Now, how that affects you as a human being is totally different. I've let people go and it hurts. I've let people go and I've sat with it for weeks or months. I've um, done all kinds of things. But again, I'm not ESPN, right? Like I don't, I, uh, the connection I have, I try to make sure I know everyone's name. I try to make sure I say hello to everyone when they're in the building. I try to make sure that every single person matters to me, whether they've been here for 10 minutes or fucking 10 months or 10 years. Mm -hmm. So, 
And I hope I never lose that connection. And there's a lot of things, a lot of people would differ and disagree with me that, no, but you can't be that connected. But if I'm not that connected, then it's not really my company. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I mean, the human aspect of it and the demonizing, if you will, of the people at the top will always happen. That's all I mean. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, the, it will it will always happen. The the person who fired someone else, whether it be on, like for a good reason, Cody wasn't on purpose. I mean, well, I don't think it was, it was, it was a layoff. It was a right a cost um, thing. Even if you know that that person should be fired, I think if you're a good boss, you know that person intimately, at least fairly intimately, and you know what that the ramifications of that does for somebody. And I, and I will say, uh, kind of, you know, going back to things that I appreciate about Dan Lebetard, and this is just me fucking talking shit as a, the same way that you are as a fan, as a listener, is I hear that show, and I hear the kind of place that I would want to work in a yeah, lot yeah. of ways. You know what I mean? For sure. And, and that I have worked in the past. Like, I've been very fortunate with the places that I work. Uh, so so I can appreciate that. And I wouldn't even say – it's probably not even <laughs> fair to say that I'm half on board. I'm like 75% on board. It was just that little touch there that was like, eh, I, I don't need to yeah, make I mean, anybody the bad guy. Like it was just a shitty situation. Well, you, you, don't like, you don't like making anyone the bad guy though. That's not true. There are a lot of bad guys. Yeah, I mean, you know, but a lot of people that uh, – a lot of things that other people would consider bad guys, you don't like to make them the bad guy. Yeah, but that's just – Uber I, Eats. I, I have different bad guys. The evil empire. Ghost think, Kitchen. I don't, I don't think they're the Equally bad guys. Equally evil empire. I don't think they're the bad guys. Yeah. I mean, I think that they're the bad guys. Yeah, I know you do. So, and that, it goes back to a lot of things that we've talked about. Back to the minimum wage thing. Back to the um, the 30% thing. It's There's a lot to me that those guys are the bad guy. Because for me, intimately, what makes food special is the experience. Right? Sure. I know well, this is a different tangent, but that's why they're... They are thinking that the experience is not important. The experience can be boxed up and sent. The experience does not matter. When was the what last time you were at a drive through ma- For me? Oh, man, it's been a while. drive through What was the last time you, okay, what was the last time that you ate food that came from a drive through Oh, um, it's been a while. How long is a while? A good amount of time. What's a good amount of time? I don't know. Matter of months, years, weeks? No, months, months. But several, several months. Did it fulfill some kind of a need for you? Um, or a desire? It depends. If I'm super stoned, I mean, a lot of things fill the void. Okay. Yeah. So Hot like, pockets, all bagel I'm, bites. All I'm getting at here is that there's a demand. It fulfills some kind of a demand. Uh-huh. You had a demand for food that came from a drive through You didn't sit somewhere and have a an interaction with human beings who brought you this food and crafted whatever the fuck. So all I'm saying is that if the if the market Are you relating demand, like drive throughs to Uber Eats? Not necessarily. No, I, I'm no, I but I my point is in some ways yes. Speaking I'm not saying, about Uber, whatever saying, happened to that guy that was going to be on the show? Oh, no, I I I will come out I, I have no problem saying that I do not appreciate how <laughs> okay. uh, we were sort of led on. We were led on by Uber. That Eats. something would happen and it did not happen. I will not say that it's all Javi's fault. Uh, I am willing to bet that somebody above him, uh, you know. Because uh, Uber doesn't want to talk away. to me. Maybe, maybe not. Uber I, doesn't want to talk I, to me. I, I, I we got 22 not, listeners. What do they got to answer. lose? We do not have 22 listeners. We have more than 22, 22 million. Listeners. We have approximately 22 billion listeners <laughs> lo- worldwide. Huge. And Uber Eats were huge, and, uh, you know, you should come and do this. Uh, <laughs> they don't want to talk to us. I don't know. but They don't want to talk to us. In any case, my point is just that— Why I don't they want to talk to us? I don't know, man. But my point is that I don't see— Losers. I don't see these people as evil empires because I think that they're fulfilling a demand. And I think that—and uh, this is a whole other podcast. I think we could easily do a podcast just about this. And I would love to really—because we've never really, like, dug in and picked your brain on this exclusively for an hour. Uh, so let's leave it for another time. But I do think that it's an interesting question. Like, where is the line between uh, the marketplace reflecting consumer demand and the marketplace reflecting some, like, battle between different types of models? Uh, 
And that's not to say that anything is good or bad or better. I or just worse. gotta say, so like the ghost kitchen, the thing, the combo kitchen. I loved it. I loved it. I loved their. I, I, I often love how bad some social medias are, and this like ghost combo kitchen thing. Their social media is no, so. Uh, combo kitchen is a is a, a what a brand or a company. Combo kitchen is a thing, right? Well, what does that mean? Let me. I'm gonna put it in context. It's a thing that what they do is they create, I believe, a commissary kitchen style thing that has that houses several concepts so that they can be fed out through third party delivery systems. Right? Okay. So the Miami Herald just wrote a thing. They've been writing a lot of things, but they wrote a thing about this. And the photo of that struck me. A lot and i actually sat and stared I, at that photo it, yeah. for like 10 minutes and it looked like a scene out of like a sci-fi film right i, I disagree but that's fine yeah. and it was like it just looked like the, it looked like a storage facility and there's one random guy that was there and, and it was like i felt so dead inside about the food that was happening there right because it's and this is what I mean. I'm an interesting business owner, right? Because it, I'm going to make that one of the, the quote graphics. Yeah. The sermons. I am an interesting business owner. So I, I am know. because like for me, not everything has to do about dollars and cents. For me. No, but I think that's a lot of people. Yeah, no, I'm sure there's a lot of other interesting business owners. I mean, in some ways, I'm an inter- it, by that standard, I'm an interesting business. Owner. I know we've turned down several ads for other people that aren't croquet the doorstops because croquet the doorstop is nationwide. That's right. So I am, uh, to put it in dining terms, eating a cable <laughs> <laughs> because because of these uh, some of the shit. Right. Yeah. So I look at that and I feel. Uh, soulless i feel like there's no love and there's no passion and then there's the equal there's the little voice in the room but it's giving an opportunity for someone that doesn't have a brick and mortar or whatever i'd be interested to find out how many of those people there actually are in comparison to the person that has lots of money and says we're just going to do these five generic concepts out of this one bay and we're going to call it burger Ieto, and then we're gonna call it salad imas, and we're gonna call it fucking, I don't know, so many other things like pitas on top of peat. I don't know, like, and they yeah. just give all this generic shit, and there's no love behind the food, and there's no, there's no like soul. It's just, and it's the continuation of all the shit we continue to see, which is just this like, it's all about fucking money, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I know for you it doesn't strike the same, but for me it matters a lot. No, but but he, so here's here's where I am. I I think I see it in many ways similar to how you see it. I disagree that it's necessarily true that there isn't soul. Here's here's an example. We have talked about the uh, Domino's thin crust. You happen to like the Domino's thin crust. If I, I like Domino's thin crust. If I put a Domino's thin crust in front of you, you'll eat the fuck out of it. I'll me. crush it. Hawaiian. Okay. Now, with my man Matt. If, Matt. If somebody came Hinkley, around, if because Hawaiian of one of these. For if, president. <laughs> if because of one of these ghost kitchen whatevers, right? Because I think Combo Kitchen is a particular company in the ghost kitchen space. My favorite. Okay, go on. So. If it's because of one of these things that somebody else comes along and they're able to make their product available to somebody who would otherwise be eating Domino's thin crust, uh-huh. is there less soul there than the alternative? Have they brought less of that whatever you want to call it to that diner's experience that now they have an alternative to Domino's? Somebody who maybe is... A lo- or even if they're not a fucking local small time business owner, maybe it's some other big name chef who brings something else to the table. Oh, the big name chef thing and- opening up in the middle of a fucking pandemic. We're going back the David Chang route with Fuku or whatever. Well, but we're also going, but we're also going to Michael Schwartz with whatever his bagel thing was, whatever his. But it's not the same. But I'm I'm not saying that it's the same across the board. But there's an analog. There's an there's an analogy to be drawn there where he had a concept. 
that was working. I don't know what was the physical space they were working from. It's not like you weren't getting, you know, somebody coming to your door with a fucking napkin over their forearm, you know, presenting. No, you were getting a delivery from Michael. I mean, Schwartz all those things was, were in the middle of a pandemic, right? Sure. Yeah. So it's different. And but that's consumer demand. It, it's not because. The, the market, the, the providers were adjusting to the market demand. Not Are you ready to live in a world that restaurant spaces don't exist? That's not going to happen. I'm ready I to. Do, I would heavily disagree that if we continue to go down this road, that restaurant dining rooms will disappear. They will not disappear. And I'll, okay. here, here's a good analogy. Here's a good comparison point. Theaters. Theaters will not disappear. There are some theater experiences that just make sense in a theater. I'm and ex- there are other theater experiences... And there are other theater experiences that do not make sense in a theater. And so now what you have is a shift in the market where there is a demand for in-theater films where the consumer has a sense of, like, this is a movie you got to go see in person. But this other movie is a movie that, you know what, bro, just watch that shit at home because it's the same shit. It's, you're going to get more value. If you're bringing the consumer more value... I say all the better. But that doesn't mean that there won't always be experiences that make more sense in that traditional space. And I think the same is true for the dining experience. Maybe it's uh, a tier to, from the fast casual to white tablecloth. To me, Maybe the combo kitchen is equivalent to the guy. Let's say you're at a barbershop. Yep. <coughs> it's a great analogy. I don't do that often. <laughs> I know. Let's say you're at a barbershop and you're getting a haircut. Yeah. And this guy walks in. You know, so, hey man, you seen that new film? You know, the That's new what one, your the new one with Angelina Jolie. You seen that shit? It's in the movie theater. I got it right here. I got it right here. He opens it up and says, "I got it right here." Yeah, five bucks. Yeah, you want it? That's what Combo Kitchen is to me. Combo it's Kitchen. That, Combo Kitchen is bootleg DVDs. Bootleg DVDs. Bootleg. Wow, one hundred and fifty fucking percent. Okay. It's bootleg DVDs. It's bootleg watches. It's bootleg all that shit. Okay. That's what it is. I think that. If we continue down this path, we will continue to see restaurant dining rooms empty up. And then less restaurants will exist. Equivalent with the minimum wage thing. It's just like there's all kinds of – because those guys will execute five concepts with three cooks while we're trying to execute one concept with four cooks. Okay. Like I said, I think this deserves its own whole show, so I'm not going to go down that road. It, uh, you know, this is because the the equating it to the minimum wage thing is, I have a hard time wrapping my head around how those two things are equivalent. A hundred and fifty percent. How do you not figure if you're able to pump out five generic concepts uh-huh. out of one small space, and you're paying those four guys fifteen bucks an hour or eighteen bucks an hour, whatever you're paying them. Sure. Yeah. Right. In comparison to now, I'm putting you in a dining room uh-huh. with four cooks trying to equate the nice fancy food or whatever the fuck it may be, plus servers and runners and bartenders and yeah, managers. Yeah. And so, it's the same thing. Those two things right now, you have found you have found yourself a loophole. You have found yourself a loophole to be like, all right, fifteen dollars minimum wage is okay, but I'm going to do five trash concepts out of one. No, but you're ta- okay. So you're talking about two different things. You're talking about how I'm not the- talking about two different no, things. No, you're talking about, about the same you, thing. You're talking about how those two things interact: the minimum wage and these different forms of service. Yeah, that doesn't mean that they're the same thing. That means that one affects the other. And I do agree. I agree that the fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage creates an artificial advantage. For these ghost kitchen concepts, which I am not it cool. It creates an advantage, period. Which I'm not artificial, cool. Artificial, no. I'm, it's just an advantage. No, it's, it's artificial. It's artificial in the sense that it's not a naturally occurring advantage because it's not that consumers just wanted it that much. What it does is it creates, it, it creates a price floor. It creates a floor where you have to do X in order for it to make sense. Sure. It's artificial. It's it's not a naturally occurring thing where like the market just really wanted ghost kitchens. No. What what the market wanted was X and then the fifteen dollar so it's two different things. I, I will say uh Yeah, I I lost my train of thought here. Shock. But but no, but I, I, I don't think they're the same thing. I think they interact and I don't like when there's an artificial uh a perversion of of that market. 
where there's a demand for X and then the $15 an hour minimum wage comes in and X becomes unfeasible. Because I do think that there is a, a number of people who want to have a certain experience and then if they are priced out of that experience, they will settle for something else. And that creates an artificial demand for the ghost kitchens. The ghost kitchens do benefit from the bullshit of, of those perversions of the market. But it's not. But but I but I don't blame the ghost kitchens. I blame the people who allowed that to happen in the first place. Yeah, I do too. What I love about the combo kitchen the most is their um, social media and their use of it. And okay. I haven't how, looked at a lot of it. Oh yeah, just how they backed. They went political from day one. They backed certain people politically. They, oh, we talked about this a little bit. Yeah, then yeah. they did like these trash forums, like the the trailblazers of the community, which of which were fucking terrible. GMCVB people, fucking. Were you not um, invited as a trailblazer? <laughs> I and I would decline. I would if I if if they would have invited me, I would have just talked shit about them the entire Welcome time. Welcome to Bancon Trailblazing. Yeah. With um, I the moderator was a real estate person. One of the people was a GMC VB person, which knows nothing about restaurants. Yeah. Um, there was only one decent person on that panel, which represented the bars in Winwood. Yeah, we did this whole thing. French so guy, I don't remember people. his name, but uh, I was on a call with him with Carlos Jimenez, which somehow won a Congress seat, and um, uh, he actually had a lot of good things to say. On that call. Anyways, I think that's a good way to wrap that's this it. motherfucker up. That's where we um, end. Thank you for listening to Bangkok Podcast. This has been a real fucked up episode. I think if you just turned it on, turn it off. Go ahead and we- turn it off. If you just turned it on, turn it off. I don't know what the fuck we just did here, but I think this was absolutely an aberration, and I think we should just... Is, to, to borrow from one of Carluba and my favorite podcasters, uh, this has been Michael Beltran, and so have you. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but Okay. <laughs> Welcome. Loka.